the cross of Christ. You can see our flower slash decoration team has got us has gotten us ready for Easter here. We've got our cross up, and we talked last week about the cross. We talked about the many different types of crosses. Uh, there are several different types of crosses, and they carry different meanings, different. Uh, it carries significance depending on uh, whose cross it is, and, and they've been around a, a, a long time, longer than Jesus' crucifixion, of course. Uh, we talked about the brutality of the cross and what it means to others and what it should mean to us. We saw the pain. We saw the agony. We saw the brutality of crucifixion. We walked step by step through the process that Jesus went through, that all criminals who were sentenced to die uh, by crucifixion went through. And we saw all that he endured uh, to provide a sacrifice for our sins. And we see what happened, we, as much as we can picture it, we see what happened and understand as much as we can. And it's still amazing people's response to the cross. Then the response to the cross uh, was one of horror. And Roman culture, the, just the mention of the cross brought shudders of horror. For everyone in that day, it was a symbol of death. Uh, and so for us, it carries different significance, but knowing what it is, knowing what it was, it's amazing that some people choose to ignore the cross, but that happens. Oswald Chambers said this, a quote from last week, he said, all of heaven is interested in the cross of Christ. All of hell is terribly afraid of it, while men are the only beings who more or less ignore its meaning. And it is amazing, isn't it? Even for believers, how the cross just kind of becomes part of our decoration. Uh, and this is, this is wonderful. It's appropriate, uh, especially with our series, because we're highlighting the significance. This isn't just intended to be a decoration, but we, we look at it and we see it everywhere. We drive down the street, passing churches, seeming, seemingly on every corner, and we see crosses. And it just kind of fades into the background. And so that's what this series is about. It is about understanding what Jesus went through and the significance that his sacrifice carries. What it means for us, not only in terms of providing a way for us to be saved, but also what it means for those of us who are saved. How it should change the way we live. How our lives should reflect what we've received through Jesus' death burial, and his resurrection. And so we're in our second part here of this sermon series, and we're looking at the cross of Christ. Last week, we looked at the cross, what it means, what, it, what Jesus went through. This week, I want to ask the question, why? Why the cross? Why did Jesus, of all ways to die, why that time? Why that form of execution? We touched on this a little bit last week. We're going to go further in answering this question. Why the cross? Why did Jesus choose that? He's God. He could have chosen any way to provide a sacrifice for man. Why did he choose that? Well, we'll find the answers. We're going to be uh, somewhat, we're going to be in the same passage of Scripture that we were in last week. John 19 is kind of our base passage. We're going to be looking at quite a few verses as we go through answering this question. Why the cross? The first thing that we need to understand or we need to consider when answering this question, why the cross? Well, first, it was simply because of our sin. I mean, we can talk about why that specific method of execution, which we will, but first we need to understand the reason that a sacrifice was needed was because you and I are sinful. And not only, you know, when Adam sinned, when Adam and Eve sinned, sin entered the world, we were all born with a sin nature, but we all choose to sin. And the reality is, apart from salvation, we are trapped in sin. There is no way we can get out of sin. There's nothing you and I can do on our own to remedy the sin problem. Because we will choose to sin. That's just part of our nature. That's part of who we are. Just like Adam and Eve chose, we all make that choice. 
And so we are trapped. We are bound in sin. Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every, every human being, we all are in the same boat. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And Romans 6.23 tells us what the punishment for that is. The wages of sin is death. Now, we see this highlighted in the Old Testament, right? The, the, the awfulness of sin. And if you are going through our Old Testament reading, as we are as a church, we are seeing this unfold. We're in the book of Joshua right now, and we've seen examples of God punishing sin. He has his chosen people, the Israelites, and he, in his wisdom and his grace, chose to make a covenant with Abraham and to use the Israelites, but they too even chose to disobey, right? They, they, they had trouble getting it right. But we see God destroying nations. We see God destroying the earth through a flood. We see Sodom and Gomorrah, and then we see the nation of Israel entering the land of Canaan and God giving the instruction to destroy everyone. And that means everyone. If you're following along in our, uh, with the videos, there are a lot of different viewpoints on, on how to interpret that. And actually, uh, the Bible Project, they take the form, and this was common in the day. They believe that it's best to interpret Joshua as hyperbole, that that's, they didn't really destroy all of the, the women and children, for example. And that's one way to look at it. And, that's, and there are a lot of theologians that believe that. And that was a very popular form uh, of communication, of writing in that day to describe conquests. They would say everything was destroyed and not really meaning everything, just total defeat, total destruction. But I'm going to tell you, I, I have a hard time making the case that it, does, it doesn't mean what it says. I believe that everyone was destroyed. And that's, that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. Why would God allow women and children, for example, to be destroyed? Why did he do that with the land of Canaan and, and conquering? And I do believe that's what happened. I believe that what it says in Joshua actually happened. I don't believe you're a heretic if you believe otherwise, because it, it could possibly be that, that what is written there is symbolic. We see that in other places in Scripture. That doesn't compromise the inerrancy of Scripture. I mean, Revelation is full of symbolism, right? And you have to interpret that. But I do believe that in the case of the, the Canaanites and Sodom and Gomorrah and with the flood that everyone was destroyed. Why would God do that? Well, there are a lot of answers and there are a lot of reasons, but the reality is we're going to have a hard time accepting any of them because it's about the ugliness of sin. If you look at the Canaanites, for example, they were an evil, evil people. They practiced pagan worship, temple prostitution, even child sacrifice and worshiping their God, little g. And so God... He, he, he knows more and better than us. He determined that the entire people group needed to be wiped out, just like he did with the flood, just like he did with Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm actually going to write, am writing uh, a flock note to send out to give a little more detail on how I interpret that. I encourage you to read that when I send it out. But at the end of the day, there are reasons. God is holy. He has to deal with sin. And he knows that there are those who will not turn to him. He knows that there are those that need to be destroyed. In the Old Testament, we see that. Before the cross, we see God sort of cleaning house from time to time to make a way for his people in the land of Canaan, to protect his people from that evil influence, to allow for what would ultimately be the people through which he would bring the Messiah. And that leads us to the cross. It's a tough pill for us to swallow the punishment of, of sin. But the reality is we all deserve to be destroyed because we are all sinful. I mean, if we really want to get real, we've taken what God has given us and we've wasted it. We chose to go our own way. And what we deserve is punishment. What we deserve is separation from God. What we deserve is hell. We are bound in sin with no way out, headed for destruction. But God's covenant with Abraham, his using the nation of Israel, was leading to the moment that we 
are looking at in this series, the cross of Christ, His Son, God in, in the flesh, coming and giving His life as a sacrifice. And for what purpose? To free us from that bondage. To free us from sin. We were headed for destruction. And without Christ, we are headed for destruction. The same fate as the Canaanites and all of those who were destroyed, who rejected God. We, were he- we are headed for destruction, but because of the cross of Christ, Jesus offers a way for us to be free. Sin is serious. Satan wants to keep you trapped in sin, but Jesus came to our rescue. He came to free us from sin. And through the cross, through his sacrifice, And we'll talk about why specifically the cross, but the reason for the cross comes down to we were lost in sin. And we couldn't pay that price on our own. So Jesus came to where we are and he rescued us. Jesus saw our need. He didn't have to do this. He had compassion on us. He could have left us in sin. And he came to our rescue. I mean, think about that. He... He knew before he ever created man that man was going to sin. Which means he's God. He's perfect. He already had all of this worked out before he ever created Adam. He knew they were going to choose to sin. So he had a plan in place for salvation before man was ever created. So in creating, he already... Because of his love, because of his compassion. Yes, he's a holy God. He's a just God. He judges sin, but he's also loving and gracious. And he's caring and compassionate. And so he created, already committed to sending his son, to coming to earth and dying this brutal death to rescue us from the sin that we would get ourselves into. That's how much God loves us. That's why the cross Because he had to pay the price for sin. No one else could pay that price. Why the cross? Because sin demanded it. Why else did God choose the cross? Well, this is where we get into the significance of the cross. Specifically, the cross. As opposed to other forms of execution. It represents the humility of Jesus. In the Old Testament, they would not crucify live individuals. Execution was primarily by stoning. You read that throughout the Old Testament. We see that. However, dead bodies, and again, sorry, graphic, but if we're going to talk about this, we've got to be real. Dead bodies would be hung on a tree to symbolize the fact that they were cursed. That was, it was a symbol of being cursed by God. And so Deuteronomy 21-23 You are not to leave this corpse on the tree overnight, but are to bury him that day. For anyone hung on a tree is under God's curse. You must not defile the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So we see that this was a symbol of being cursed. This showed that those who had been put to death because of whatever they had done were cursed by God. And this practice is the reason we see in the New Testament it referenced, Jesus' cross reference as a tree. It is a symbol of a curse. 1 Peter 2, 24, He himself bore our sins in his body and on the tree so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. His body on a tree. It's symbolizing the truth that Jesus became a curse for us so that we wouldn't be cursed. So that we wouldn't be destined to spend eternity in hell, separated from God. He became our curse, the only human being, God in human form, fully God, fully man, the only human to ever live a perfect life who did not deserve punishment for sin because he had never sinned. He took on that punishment for us. He became that curse for us. That's everything in Scripture is intentional. And describing that as a tree represents the curse. But it also goes with Jesus' life and his mission while on earth. Look at Matthew 20, 28. Jesus said, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. I mean, this was the death that Jesus died. This was the death 
that the crowd begged for. He lived his life humbly. They expected a conquering servant. One day we will get that. A conquering hero, we will get that. Jesus will return and he will defeat all evil, all the enemy. He came as a servant. He came in humble means. He came to be a servant. And it threw everybody off balance. No one expected that. His life was one of humility, one of service. And his death fit that perfectly. The most humble death a person could die in this day and time. Why the cross? Because it, was, it matched the humility of Jesus. His death, Hebrews 12, 2 says he endured the cross despising the shame. He became a curse. He was shamed. The lowest rung in the ladder of Jesus' humiliation, which he willfully endured, was that he endured even death on a cross. The worst, Philippians 2.8, even death on a cross. The worst way to die. And he was also, take it a step further, he's also crucified between two thieves, right? It was a symbol that his whole life, even in his death, he kept company with sinners. It's a, it's a perfect picture of why he came. He came to save sinners. And in order to receive salvation, you have to realize that like all of us, you have sinned. And even in the events leading up to when he finally gave up his spirit, we see a reflection of how people respond to the cross. One Thief is begging for forgiveness. The other is mocking him. One is accepting what's happening and who he is. The other is ignoring Jesus' cross, mocking his cross. And so we see the significance of the cross, the humility of the cross, that he had to die the death that he did to, to properly reflect the seriousness of sin, that he was willing to humble himself. And then also that he came for sinners, the lowest of the low. He came to save those who are lost and those who know that they are lost. And it was a stumbling block because of this for the Jews. And it's a stumbling block for people today. 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. It represents his humility, but it also represents the love of Jesus. The unfailing, perfect, committed, agape, enduring love of Christ. John 15, 13, no one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. The greatest example of love is if someone's willing to give their life for the person that they love, right? There's no greater expression of love, and that's what Jesus did for us, for his children, he gave his life. And we even see, you know, when Jesus dies and he is pierced with the spear, blood and water. And you've heard this before probably, blood and water flow, right? Why is that? I mean, he literally died of a broken heart. His heart burst. And I think even that is a symbol of his love and that he gave everything. We broke his heart. Human, his creation we made it necessary for him to do that. He didn't have to do that. But in order for him to have relationship with us, in order for us to experience that, he doesn't need it. He's God. He's perfect. But in, in the grand mystery, he desires a relationship with us. He wants to express his love because he is love. He has a purpose. He's glorified in it. All of those things but it's still a mystery as to why God would endure what he endured in order to make it possible for us to experience that relationship and eternal life. We broke his heart. We sinned. And he gave everything because God is love. It represents his love. And John 19, 34, the one, when one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, Blood and water came out again, an expression, an example, an illustration, if you will, of how, just how much Jesus gave and just how much he cared. It also represents the horror of sin. You know, in all of history, there are a lot of different forms of execution. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, or any of them, really. <laughs> but there are a lot of horrible forms of execution, but I don't know of any as 
horrible as crucifixion. When you really, we walked through it in pretty fair detail last week, but let me tell you, in studying, there, there's a lot of deep, gory details that I left out because, you know, it's just for a Sunday morning, maybe not the best time. If you ever do a deep dive into crucifixion itself, you discover just how horrible it was. I don't think man has ever known a more horrible way to put a person to death. And there, there is no better way to reflect the horror of sin. We whitewash sin, right? I mean, we soft pedal it. We justify it. We're so good at justifying sin. We ignore it. We push it to the side. We don't want to deal with it because it's hard to deal with it. But sin, when you really look at what sin does to the human being, to God's creation, to man's relationship to God, how it affects the pain, the suffering, the consequences, all of those things, what sin causes, it's a horror. It's horrible. And what better way to reflect that, to depict that, to represent that than the crucifixion? The horrible death of Jesus appropriately illustrates the horrible situation that human beings in as fallen individuals, bound by sin, separated from God. Pain, heartbreak, hurt, both yourself and those that you love. Despair, alienation from God, separation from God. Jesus even endured that, right? Why, God, why have you forsaken me? He allowed himself to be separated from God because he took on our sin. All of those things are consequences, and all of those things the cross represents. Why the cross? Well, because of the horror of sin, but also because it represents the dedication, the commitment of Jesus. He could have stopped at any point. He could have called in legions of angels. He could have said, nope, this is too much. Yet he chose to endure. And it's a symbol of our union with Christ. His commitment to endure that suffering and the call on us to take up our cross daily and follow him. It represents not just that we are to follow his example. We are his commitment, his dedication, but also in regard to what he's done for us, his commitment to us. And it's easy in life, right? It's easy when we're struggling, when bad things happen, when things are happening that we don't understand. It's easy to question the love of God, isn't it? I mean, sometimes God seems distant. And there are times when he's calling us to wait and it seems like he's silent. He's always working. We may not realize it, but there are times where it feels like he's not. Let's be honest. There are times when things happen we don't understand. It's hard to trust God. It's hard to to believe that he truly does love us. But in those moments, if we can really understand what he did on the cross, if we can really gain a new appreciation for what he went through, we should always, even in the darkest of times, be able to go back to the cross, to the cross. And in that, we should never doubt the love of God. What Jesus did, God giving his only son, Jesus enduring the cross, we should never, ever doubt that he truly does love us. Yes, God is holy and he is just. He punishes sin, but he is also love. Not that he loves, he is love. And all that agape love includes, dedication, commitment, endurance. He will never stop loving you. He will not love you more tomorrow than he does today because he loves you with a perfect love that cannot be improved on. He never changes. And we see a a horrible but yet beautiful display of that love through his sacrifice on the cross. Why the cross? Because God loves us and it shows his commitment to us, his dedication In his substitutionary death for us on the cross, we died in him. And our old man, our old self was crucified with him. That by his spirit living in and through us, we can now live for him. He loved us and in his commitment, in his sacrifice, he makes it possible for us to live. And not just to live, 
Not to be free to do whatever we want, but be to, to be free to serve Him. Free from sin to serve Him and please Him and experience His plan for us on this earth and throughout eternity. It represents His commitment, His dedication, but it also represents the Lordship of Jesus. Go back to the inscription again. You know, I love reading through all of Scripture, but when you read through the Gospels and you see this event, if you really look at the, the crucifixion unfold through the resurrection, you see pieces of prophecy. I mean, you'll make your head spin how quickly. Prophecies falling into place, right? And how it's, it, it becomes so evident who Jesus is by studying just the crucifixion alone and the resurrection, but, but just that part of Scripture... I mean, there's more of Scripture that testifies to that. All of, all of the Bible is a story of God's, God's story of salvation of man from beginning to end and his victory over sin. But we see in the crucifixion the lordship of Jesus displayed so well. That inscription, the king of the Jews. And even how it was written is a testament to who he is. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. These were the three great languages of the day, of the ancient world. It stood for three great nations. And, and what we see here is that, that even in God's economy, there is something, every nation has something to teach the world, right? I mean, we learn from different people, different, uh, different nations, even different cultures, and we see that in this day and time, and I don't think this is a stretch to make this connection, but y'all bear with me. You can tell me what you think. All right. We see that these three great nations teach us something. Greece taught the world beauty of form and of thought. Now put this all in the context. The day and time, what's going on when Jesus is crucified. Not today, but then. Greece taught the world beauty of form and thought. We see also that Rome taught the world law and good government. Didn't last, but of course became corrupted, but they taught the world law and order. And then also the Hebrews taught the world religion and worship of the true God. So we see something from each nation. Now, now look at what Jesus did. Jesus, Greece taught the world beauty of form and thought. Jesus was the supreme beauty and the highest thought of God. I mean, hey, what you taught is great, but let me show you perfection. Then we see Rome. Rome taught the world law and good government. Well, Jesus, in Jesus was the law of God, the fulfillment of that law, the kingdom of God. As good as their laws were at times, and yeah, they achieved a form of peace, Rome did, forced peace. Jesus shows true peace. He shows how the law of God can be fulfilled because we can't fulfill it on our own. And then we see the Hebrews taught the world religion and worship of the true God. They were God's chosen people, but Jesus and him was the very image of the one true God. He was God. He is God. And all that they had done that had pointed toward the coming Messiah, it's fulfilled in him. He is the Messiah. We see the fulfillment of God's law. We see the long-awaited Messiah. We see finally freedom. Not freedom from government oppression, but freedom from the greatest oppression, sin, through Jesus Christ. It was symbolic that these three great languages of the world, it's written in those languages, that these three great languages called him king. And again, just another affirmation. He is who he said he was, the king of kings. The Lord of Lords, greater than any earthly kingdom. Everything, everything, this shows, I mean, you look at all of those things that we learn from those cultures or those primary things, there's a lot, but it represents the seeking, the longing of people, right? We want knowledge, we want to grow, we want to advance, and we see advancements. But what we see in Jesus in the fulfillment, in his fulfillment, we see in him everything that this world is longing for. We look in a lot of different ways, places for that, 
But we find our greatest need in Christ. Because no matter what we attempt to fill that God-shaped hole with, it will never satisfy, it will never be filled apart from freedom and forgiveness of sin that can only be found in Jesus Christ, through his death, through his sacrifice, through his resurrection. He fulfills, he, he fulfills everything that we are longing for because we don't even know what we need, but we find all that we need in Christ. But the cross, that's not all. The cross also represents the covenant of Jesus. It's the new covenant. The old cross, a symbol of death, Right? It stands for the abrupt, violent end of a human being. I mean, think about it. When the man who was convicted to die on a cross, when he took up that cross, he had already said goodbye to his family. He knew his life was over with. When he begins that journey, his family, his friends, he knows that he's headed to the end of his life. He knows that that, I mean, even though they carried that inscription out front, chances are no one was going to testify in his behalf. And especially once he was nailed to the cross or tied to the cross, he knew his life was not going to get redirected. He knew that it was the end. He knew there was no hope. The cross represented death. The cross made no compromise. It modified nothing. It spared nothing. It, it executed all of the man completely. No mercy. No one was spared. It did not try to keep good terms with the victim, right? It struck cruel. It struck hard. And when it had finished its work, it accomplished its goal. The man was no more. That's the cross, the old cross. In the race of Adam, all of us who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we are under a death sentence. Without Christ, there's no escape. We're headed to our own crucifixion. We're headed to death. No redirection, no escape. God cannot approve of any sin. And so if there's sin in our life apart from forgiveness, apart from restoration, we're headed to that same fate. And, and however innocent that sin may appear to us, however we've justified it or watered it down, it's still sin. And God punishes sin. So the old cross ends in death. The lost individual in sin is headed for death. However, Jesus is the sacrificial lamb of the new cross. Death doesn't have to be your end. The new covenant, the old covenant, the law showed us God's standard, showed us, shows us where we fall short on our own. No one can meet the law perfectly. It shows us what God requires. The new covenant, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Where we fall short, he is more than sufficient. His grace, the new cross, redirects that that man headed toward execution no chance of redemption no chance of redirection what jesus does is he redirects our lives he offers us freedom from sin and it doesn't represent this new cross the new covenant it doesn't represent the end of life anymore for the believer it represents the beginning of a new life in Christ. Look at Romans 6.23. I read the first part. The wages of sin is death, and that's true. Someone has to die. That's the payment for sin. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And then Romans 6, 25 and 26. Jump ahead a verse. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, if we die to sin we die with him, if we accept his sacrifice, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. If we die with him, we will be raised to do life because of him, because of his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so, so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. That death sentence doesn't have to be for you or for me. That doesn't have to be the end. 
It can be, the cross can be a symbol of life, a symbol of forgiveness, a symbol of freedom, a symbol of resurrection even, because we know that he died but was raised three days later. It can be a symbol of hope and assurance and future, but only, only if you're willing to accept Christ as the one and only God, Messiah, sacrifice, perfect sacrifice. There aren't many paths to God. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. There's only one path. But thank God in his grace, he offers us that path. When you really come to as much of an understanding as we can in this frail mind of who God is, and what we did with what he gave us. You know, it's easy to paint God as this vindictive, awful puppeteer that just enjoys watching people suffer. And, but no, when you really think about all that God created and that he created us out of love, out of a desire to have relationship and for us to experience that relationship and that somehow we bring him glory in that, in that creation, knowing we would sin knowing we would waste the inheritance that he gave us and then still make a way for us to be reconnected. And the suffering that he had to endure willfully to make that possible, when you really think about that, you come to a new understanding of the love and the grace and the mercy of God. You don't have to stay lost. You can be free. Now, I brought with me this morning an old pocket knife. It's Timmy's now, but it was mine. I got it probably when I was a little bit younger than him. Let me tell you why I brought this. Because this pocket knife, it's, it's, if I believed in magic, I would think that this thing was magical. I have lost this thing. I can't, I've lost count how many times I've lost it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've lost this pocket knife. Matter of fact, I think when I finally gave it to Timmy, I had lost it. I bought a new one and then found it and gave it to Timmy. Well, sure enough, we've been here about four and a half years now here in Madison. When we moved from Scottsboro to Madison, it was already Timmy's, and we thought we had lost it in the move. Again, I lost it. And I, I mean, I thought, that's it. It is gone. We looked everywhere. We could not find it. And I thought, finally, this thing is gone. Well, about six months ago, we were cleaning out some boxes that we had stored up here in the building outside the office, and we were cleaning out boxes, and evidently Timmy had taken this and put it in a little box inside a bigger box down at the bottom. We were cleaning out the, this box. I just happened to open it up, and sure enough, there was that pocket knife. So we had been here for over, over three years or right at or four years. We had been here four years I thought this thing was gone, but sure enough, it turned back up again. I'm telling you, there's something about this thing. I don't know. It just keeps... And we had already bought Timmy another one, right? He, I mean, we, after we moved here, I, we'd gotten him another pocket knife. So this, uh, it's still his, but, and I had to get him to get it for me. I was a little afraid maybe we lost it again after we found it. But, I mean, this thing just keeps showing up. You know, the reality is, in, in sin, when we are in sin, when we are lost... We cannot get out of sin. Without some divine intervention, I'm not saying this was divine intervention, but without some divine intervention, you're going to stay lost. I mean, there's just no way out on your own. I can't get you out. You can't get yourself out. But just like this pocket knife, you don't have to stay lost. Evidently, this pocket knife does not like to stay lost. You don't have to stay lost. You can be found. You can receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ, but he won't force it on you. You have to humble yourself. Recognize that like all of us, you have sinned and fallen short of his glory. But, but you're in good company, okay, because we all have. And those of us who know Christ, we came to that point in our lives where we realized that we could not, not remedy our own sin problem. That the only way to be forgiveness was to invite Jesus to believe that he died on the cross for my sins, for your sins, that he paid the price, and to invite him into my life to forgive me of that sin. That he died and that he was buried and that he was raised from the dead three days later. And that he's alive today with the power to save you and to keep you and to use you for his glory. And to carry you into eternity to spend with him for all of eternity when this life is over. 
if you will put your faith and trust in him, that cross will carry a brand new significance for you. It'll mean something completely different than it means to all those without Christ. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for sending your son Jesus. We may not know all of the all of the reasons as to why you chose the death that you did, but we know the bottom line reason and that's because we were lost in sin and you desired that we be saved. A gift of grace, a gift of mercy. We don't res- receive what we do deserve and that's punishment and death. But through you, if we will put our faith and trust in you, Jesus, to believe that you are God, that you died for our sins, that you were buried, that you were raised from the dead, if we will invite you into our lives, for those that don't know you, they will invite you into their lives and receive that gift of salvation. We can be saved and set free. I pray that if there's anyone here today, in person or listening, who has never accepted that free gift of salvation, Holy Spirit, just bring them under conviction, or if they are right now, just draw them to yourself. And I pray that they will cry out right where they are and ask you into their lives to save you, to save them and set them free from sin. Lord, if there's anyone here today who is saved, and maybe we've just kind of grown accustomed to the cross and all that it represents, maybe we've become desensitized to the violence and the torture and the pain and the suffering that you went through for us. I pray that we would just meditate on that, not as some sort of form of self-punishment or obsession with gore, but so that we would, we would come to a new understanding and appreciation for what you've done for us and what you set us free from, the horror of sin. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for what you continue to do to sustain us and what you've promised to do in the future. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand for our time of decision?